I'm being completely and totally honest here. I 100% did not expect to make an XFL power rankings video after one week. Honestly, I didn't really expect to make more than one XFL video at all. But I truly had so much fun watching week one of the XFL and I really am looking forward to week two more than I thought I would. So I figured I'll be making these power rankings in my head anyway, so why not have a place where I can share them? At the very least, I can check my own work. So here we go. If your rankings differ, please let me know in the comments and we'll discuss. These are week one's XFL power rankings. Side note, yes, I'm playing NCAA 14. It's the most fun football game I have on hand. And until the XFL gets its own video game, this is where we're stuck. Number eight, Tampa Bay Vipers. I believe the Vipers opened at the joint highest odds to win the XFL championship. But if you watched my last video breaking down the good and the bad of the XFL, which should hopefully be popping up in the right hand corner of this video, go check it out so I can feed my pet fish for the week, you'll know I was clear about my skepticism regarding Vegas's accuracy. And at least for week one, turns out I should have been skeptical. The Vipers looked lethargic, their offense barely moved. Aaron Murray had a disastrous first game, completing less than 50% of his passes and throwing two picks. Two bright spots here. I don't think Murray will continue to be that poor, and if he does, Quentin Flowers had a few shining moments, especially on the ground. Now, I don't think that offense was designed to run the option consistently, which is surely where Flowers would be most comfortable, but at least it's an option, no pun intended. For now though, the Vipers have to take my wooden spoon as the team I was least impressed by early on. Quick add-on note here, I saw as I was recording, Aaron Murray is reported out for week two, so we'll find out sooner than later if Flowers is a viable option. Number seven, LA Wildcats. Now, the Wildcats actually played a pretty solid football game against a Roughnecks team that, spoiler alert, will finish high on these rankings. But the reason they rank so low is simple, no balance. Chad Kanoff played an average game, going 21 of 39 for 214 yards and a touchdown. On the ground though, the Wildcats combined for just 95 yards on 24 attempts. Less than four yards per carry as a team will not get it done. The XFL will demand a stronger running game as the defenses seem to be able to handle most of the quarterbacks, including Kanoff. LA's running game will not cut it if those are the numbers they're putting up, and since we have just one week to go on, this is where they fall. Number six, Seattle Dragons. I put the Dragons above the Wildcats for one reason. I like their coach better. Seattle had similar issues in the running game against the defenders, racking up just 97 total yards. But their 4.6 yards per carry average is, of course, slightly better. Like Kanoff, quarterback Brandon Silvers had at best an average game, completing 53% of his passes for 217 yards and three touchdowns, but also throwing two picks. So they're very similar teams, but I just like the way Jim Zorn managed the game against the defenders as far as play calling goes. I think there's more room to grow in Seattle while hopefully not relying on Silvers to throw the ball 40 times. At 4.6 yards per carry, you can afford to replace 10 to 15 of those attempts with run plays, chewing clock, and hopefully reducing turnovers. They're not a perfect team, but they're not quite the worst team in the league as Vegas predicted. Number five. Dallas Renegades. Now, originally, I was going to put St. Louis in the fifth spot. It seemed fairly obvious to me. The Battlehawks and Renegades looked fairly even. Yes, the Battlehawks came out on top, but of course, Dallas was missing starter, starting quarterback Landry Jones. Jones might be the most polished quarterback in the XFL right now, so surely he'd be worth more than six points, the margin of victory in that game. Initially, I thought so, but then I remembered, these are power rankings. This isn't me trying to pick the eventual champion. I'm ranking every team after their week one performance, and Dallas's week one performance was very poor. Yes, backup quarterback Philip Nelson played well enough, going 33 of 42 for 209 yards, but their measly 58 rushing yards was the third worst in the league, and without seeing Landry Jones, I can't make an accurate assessment of how they'll play with him. Yes, they run an air raid, so my placement of them here is reflective of my confidence Jones can do at least an average job in that offense, but without actually seeing him on an XFL field, this is the highest I could possibly go. Number four, 
DC Defenders. Truth be told, I didn't initially plan on having the four losers at the bottom and the four winners at the top, but you'll see in a second why that changed. For now, the Defenders are at the bottom of my winners column, so to speak, simply because I'm not sold. They're basically the opposite of the next team on my list. They scored a lot of points, but I can't quite figure out why. Cardale Jones had a good enough game, but there are certainly quarterbacks who outplayed him. Their starting running back, Donnell Pomfrey, recorded just five yards on four attempts. He's supposedly fully healthy this week. He isn't listed at all on the injury report, so we'll see if that changes. All in all, DC might have one of the two best teams when it's all said and done. They certainly have enough former NFL talent to catch your eye, especially on defense. But with a running back who couldn't get involved, a quarterback who I think is bang average by XFL standards, and a defense that failed to generate any pressure against Seattle's below average offensive line, I can't put them any higher than fourth. Number three, St. Louis Battlehawks. Unfortunately for St. Louis fans, this list is not the power rankings of mascots, but they've still gotta be pretty happy where they finished. Like I mentioned, in a power rankings format, I'm going with the known over the unknown. For that reason, I keep moving St. Louis higher and higher on my list as I'm writing. And I think we know more about St. Louis now than we know about almost any other team. Jordan Ta'amu was incredibly impressive, going 20 for 27 for 209 yards and a touchdown and adding 77 yards on the ground. He was the second best quarterback in my opinion, more on the first later. The Battlehawks come in with a strong two-pronged rushing attack and a polished play caller that keeps things fresh. The defense recorded four sacks from four different players, which is the balance you need to have in the XFL. But we also saw in stark contrast their weaknesses, namely the skill players. I didn't see any of their receivers or tight ends I'd be exceptionally worried about. Ta'amu played well, but Dallas's defense is average at best, if not a bit below average. So going up against a better defensive system might give Ta'amu some problems. All that being said, they kept rising on the list for me because the more I looked at the stats from their game against Dallas, the more I felt they actually may have the tools to make a deep run in the XFL. Watching their game against the Renegades, I figured those two teams would have to be 4-5 and five on the list. They looked bang average to me. And for an offense that seemed to be so prolific, the Battlehawks only put up 15 points and struggled in short yarded situations, which seemed weird to me. But I've actively persuaded myself to put them higher because of all the upside I see from Ta'amu, Matt Jones, and the fact the presumptive starting running back Christine Michelle didn't even play week one. Number two, Houston Roughnecks. My placement of Houston here violates most of the rules I seem to have already set in this list. They finished with the second worst rushing attack in the league with an almost sickening 50 yards on 16 attempts. Their quarterback was not overly efficient, completing just 61% of his passes, and their consensus best receiver coming in, Sammy Coates, caught just two passes on nine targets and dropped several balls. Despite all that, I'm putting Houston here for two reasons, their quarterback and their defense. PJ Walker was sensational despite his fairly pedestrian completion percentage. He made NFL caliber throws into tight windows. He threw a beautiful deep ball, and he spread the ball around better than any quarterback in the league. Eight different players caught a ball from Walker, six of them caught multiple. Walker threw four touchdowns to four different receivers. One of my favorite YouTube channels, Flemlo Raps, go check him out, mentioned Walker on his list of players to watch before the season, and man was he spot on. On top of that, their defense looked scary against the Wildcats. They really set the tone with some big hits. They recorded five sacks with five different players getting on the stat sheet for that. They hit the quarterback 10 times, defended 11 passes, and forced three turnovers at the hands of three different players. Even though they gave up 17 points, the second highest point scored among losing teams, that seemed more a function of Houston's breakneck offensive pace, even by XFL standards. For all their weaknesses in the running game, P.J. Walker's performance and their utterly stellar defensive showing makes me confident Houston will be thoroughly in the mix for the XFL championship. Number one, New York Guardians. I knew this was going to be my pick for the number one team from halftime of their game against the Vipers. Yes, I ranked the Vipers last, so how could the team that beat them be first? I mean, shouldn't it have been an easy win? Frankly, I can't even really describe what I saw from the Guardians or why it makes me so confident they're the best team in the league right now. 
they had an even worse rushing attack than the Roughnecks with just 44 yards on 16 attempts. Their quarterback, Matt McGloin, didn't play as well as P.J. Walker, completing just 52% of his passes for 182 yards and a touchdown. But there's nothing I overtly dislike about their team. Yes, the rushing attack looks bad, but I think the Vipers actually have one of the three best run defenses in the league based on the players they have. McGloin didn't make any major mistakes, he spread the ball around almost as well as P.J. Walker with five men catching multiple passes, and those skill players at wide receiver and tight end looked more dangerous to me than Houston's. With the exception of Joe Horn, who I think was an outlier, no player had more than two receptions fewer than their number of targets. Essentially, what I'm saying is they spread the ball efficiently and they chewed a lot of clock. Their defense was as dangerous, if not more so, than Houston's, recording five sacks, two picks, and three forced fumbles, and they were in the Viper backfield almost all night. The difference between New York and Houston is razor thin right now, but there's something about the Guardians that had me watching them saying this is the best team in the XFL right now. I'm sure you disagree with my picks, and if you do, head down to the comments and we'll discuss. Subscribe to GA Sports for all our content now and in the future. Thanks so much for watching. We appreciate you.